Iniciar. Ok. Los que están en línea, ¿es inglés o español? Eh, en estoy... inglés. La anunciamos en inglés. Sí, pero bien no estaba pensando hacerlo en español. Les pregunto. Sí, sí, gusto. Checa si en línea. Ok, good afternoon everybody. Looking at the audience, is it okay if I switch to Spanish or do you prefer English? English? Is there anybody who wouldn't be okay in Spanish? Más o menos, quieren practicar? English? Okay. Okay. Yeah, I'm okay. Okay. So, I'll explain a little bit this afternoon what we are doing in the strategic research, uh, research team in uh, the Sustainable Intensification Program in Latin America. I can't speak up. I'm sick, so I, this is a, as loud as it gets. Only Ricardo can do something about that. I'm sorry. Um, oh, yeah. I, I think that's... <laughs> okay. Can everybody hear me like this? Otherwise, I mean, there's plenty of space here in the front if you, if you prefer. I, no, I really don't like that. It's okay? Okay, good. Okay, so I'll, I'll explain the two main things that we do in the team. The first one um, is field research. Second one is post-harvest activities. Uh, since uh, last year, uh, we're also doing that in the research team. Uh, so I'll talk a little bit about that as well in the end of the presentation. So we'll start first with the field-based research. Um, I think you all know what conservation agriculture is, but I just wanted to make sure for those that uh, haven't been with us very long. Um, so conservation agriculture builds on three components minimizing soil movement as much as possible, using soil surface cover that can be through crop residue retention of the previous crop or life cover, um, and crop diversification, which can be through crop rotation uh, in a sequence or uh, by using more than one crop in the same field um, at the same time. So, of course, um, you can do those three things, minimize your soil movement, use soil surface cover, diversify your crops, and have a very unsustainable system if, on top of those three uh, components, you're not building the right water management, you're not using the right varieties, managing your weeds appropriately, um, providing the nutrients for the crop, etc. So it's very important that, in addition to those three basic things, um, we also develop appropriate component technologies like pest and disease management, the right varieties, etc. So um, I'll be talking about the two components in our field-based research. First thing is that we work, of course, in CIMIT stations. And uh, in addition to that, we also work in a network with local collaborators connected to the innovation systems uh, that we have here in Mexico. So if we look first at the on-station research um, that is based on long-term and component technology trials in three uh, experimental stations of CIMIT um, in Toluca, here in Albatán, of course, and in Ciudad Obregón, that also have very uh, contrasting agroecological environments and very different production systems. If you look at Ciudad Obregón in the north, uh, it's irrigated agriculture, high input, high quality uh, yields, um, mainly wheat systems. And if you look at the farmers around the station, uh, it's bigger farmers uh, with a lot of area and uh, larger machinery than what we see in central Mexico. Here in El Batan, we have a semi-arid climate we uh, use rain-fed uh, experiments mostly, uh, like the farmers do in the surroundings, low input agriculture. In Toluca, it rains a bit more. Uh, maize is the most important crop for farmers, uh, even though, of course, it's a wheat uh, station. So we also grow uh, a little bit of wheat, but mostly maize at the station there. So if you look at the research on station, 
Um, one important aspect of that is our long-term experiments where we focus on those conservation agriculture principles that we just saw. So we look at different tillage practices, crop rotations, and residue managed practices. Uh, right now we have six long-term experiments, two here in El Batan, uh, the oldest one where we take all of our visitors, and uh, so probably you have visited as well, is D5. Um, that was started in 91. Then we have three in Ciudad Abregón, uh, one that was started in 92, and then two that were uh, more recent. And in 2014, we also started a long-term experiment in Toluca. So why do we keep um, those long-term experiments, the oldest is more than 25 years, so why do we keep doing them? No, haven't we learned enough after 10 years or 15 years? So why do we think it's important to um, keep those long-term experiments going? Um, those long-term data sets that we generate, data that we take every year, like yield, for example, um, allow us to study stability, adaptability to different uh, climate conditions, for example. Um, they also allow us to look at different aspects um, depending on collaborations that we have with uh, research institutes, for example. I mean, there's a core set of data that we take every year, and then there are data that we uh, take, and I'll show some of those later. Uh, for example, if you have a PhD student that is uh, interested in soil insects, then uh, we can do a detailed study on that. Um, and having those long-term experiments where the treatment effects have become very clear after so many years uh, allows us to do that. And then, of course, they're very important for training, for researchers. As I said, D5, uh, most of you have probably visited there because we take all our visitors there. They're very, there's very clear uh, treatment effects there that can be observed and uh, that people tend to remember um, when they see them more than when uh, they read about it or see a graph. So if you look at some results of those long-term experiments, just as an example, these are yield results. Um, for El Batan, on the left side, we have rain-fed maize and wheat. And this is a graph from Ciudad Obregón uh, for irrigated wheat. So first, if we look at the rain-fed experiment, and we start with the maize here in the top graph, um, we can see um, in green conservation agriculture, so that means in this case, a rotation of maize and wheat. It's zero tillage on the flat. And we are leaving all of the residue in the field. And then in blue, you can see what the farmers in the area are used to doing in terms of uh, tillage rotation and residue management. And that is doing conventional tillage, monoculture, and removing uh, all of the crop residue from the field. They tend to use it for fodder. Um, and then in red, you can see what happens if farmers here about zero tillage and they stop tilling their soil, but they keep doing monoculture and they keep removing the residue from their fields. So the first thing that you can see is when farmers do that, the red line here, uh, they get lower yields uh, than when they keep doing farmer practice. So it's very important that if farmers adopt zero tillage that they also uh, look at the other components of conservation agriculture. Then we do see in green that uh, with conservation agriculture, we have higher and more stable yields than with conventional practice, uh, with the exception of some years where we have extreme events. This is um, in 2011, we had early frost, uh, so that means um, frost right after flowering, which ends uh, the cropping cycle for maize. In 1999, we had hail also during flowering, that time, uh, so no pollen and no, um, no grain formation. Then if we look um, here in 2009 is when we see a very large difference between conservation agriculture and uh, conventional tillage and zero tillage without residue. In 2009, we had a very extreme drought here uh, in the highlands where from mid-July until mid-August, uh, we had almost no rain. Um, so we had extreme moisture stress in the treatments that didn't have a lot of soil moisture uh, available in the soil, um, as was the case in the conventional treatment. Uh, whereas in conservation agriculture, where during the dry season, uh, the profile had uh, conserved and infiltrated a lot more soil moisture, we had normal vegetative development and uh, high yields. And if you look at the wheat, first thing we see is that there are differences between uh, 
management practices are smaller than what we see uh, with maize. Uh, wheat is a little less sensitive to management uh, than maize in general, but we still see that with the green uh, line with conservation agriculture, we get higher and more stable yields. Um, and in this case, we see that with wheat monoculture, um, zero tillage, removing all of the residue, we have similar yields as uh, with the conventional practice. Even in the last couple of years, we've had yields that were a, bit, a, a little bit higher. Um, that's different from what we see with maize. Um, why? Because wheat has a very different uh, population structure. If you think of a wheat field, there's a lot more stalks, um, and the root structure of wheat is also very different than the one from maize. You get more uh, fine roots close to the surface that help to develop uh, soil structure. So wheat monoculture in terms of uh, physical soil degradation is less problematic uh, than maize uh, monoculture. So then if we look at irrigated conditions, Ciudad Alvaregón, um, there we have um, wheat in the winter and maize in the summer in all of our treatments. It's irrigated. So first thing you see is that we have a lot less variability uh, among years as what we see here um, in rain-fed conditions. And we also see much smaller differences between different management practices um, because, of course, you're correcting that very important factor uh, that water is. And so here, if you look at the blue line and the green line, um, so conventional versus conservation agriculture, we don't see differences in this experiment in yield with two crops a year. Um, so that means that for farmers, the incentive to use conservation agriculture will be uh, looking at profitability, reducing costs, rather than uh, the higher and more stable yields that we see in conditions where water is a limiting factor. So that's very briefly something about our long-term trials. Then we have component technology trials. In component technology trials, we are looking at uh, the blue uh, circles uh, that were in the first graph. So those component technologies, how to manage your weeds, how to manage your uh, nutrients, uh, identifying the right uh, genotypes, etc. cetera. Um, so they're usually uh, shorter duration. Once we figure out how to do a certain thing, control a certain weed, it doesn't make much sense to keep uh, doing the same experiment. Uh, so after a couple of years, if we figure it out, we move on uh, and change those experiments to something else. And what we've identified as the back best practice becomes our uh, best practice that we incorporate into our long-term experiments. So to go a little bit more now into the kind of research uh, that we do, uh, we have a very broad range of research topics and I'll just uh, give a few examples. Um, this is to give you an idea that it ranges from very uh, concrete problems that we see, something practical, something that isn't working that we need uh, to solve over research with a vision to have impact in 10 or 15 years. Um, and then we have blue sky research focused on understanding the systems we work in, but that doesn't really have an immediate application uh, right now. And an example that I'll give of that is uh, soil microbial community research. We want to understand what is going on. We see differences in plant growth, for example. Uh, we like to know um, what is happening in the soil, uh, but there's no immediate application of what we learn uh, right now. So first, an example, what you can see in the picture here is a field uh, with very different weed germination on the left and the right side. Uh, this is a picture from uh, Ciudad Obregón, um, where farmers in the Yaqui Valley there they usually plant wet. That means we've already seen it's irrigated conditions. So farmers there usually irrigate. Then they uh, wait until the soil dries out enough to be able to get in uh, with a tractor. They control weeds and they plant. That has certain advantages. Um, for example, you can do weed control. So usually you irrigate so the weeds come up and then you can control them at or before planting. Um, the disadvantage is that it reduces your flexibility in terms of planting date because you need to irrigate and then a couple of weeks later you need to plant and then if it rains still in that um, window, imagine you're a big farmer, you have 100 hectares and you've irrigated them all 
according to a certain calendar, and then two weeks after you've started irrigating your different blocks, it rains, so everything is wet again, so everything will be ready at the same time for planting, and that is, of course, a practical uh, issue. Then if you do dry planting, um, what you do is you plant into dry soil, and then the next day or a couple of days later, you irrigate your soil. Um, the advantage of that is that it gives you a bit more flexibility in terms of planting date. The disadvantage is that since your soil is dry when you're planting, your weeds and your uh, crop will come up at the same time, uh, so that makes weed control um, a lot harder. An extra advantage of dry uh, seeding is if you're looking at conservation agriculture, you have residue at your surface, um, then it tends to be easier to manage that residue if you plant dry than if you plant wet. Um, you can still plant wet, of course. Uh, we do in most of our trials, but it's a little bit easier to plant dry. Uh, so that means that if you're moving to conservation agriculture, maybe you're also shifting a bit more of your area to dry planting than before. Now, the problem that we have is this is what we have in terms of emergence with wet planting in conservation agriculture, and this is what we see in terms of emergence with dry planting, which is, of course, an issue because if a farmer has a field like that, uh, there's almost no plants there, no? Um, the strange thing is that it's not directly tied to a clear disease. Normally, if you have a field that looks like that um, at emergence, um, either you think, well, there was a problem with the machine and we didn't put any seed there, or you uh, assume that there's a, a significant disease problem that is attacking your seed that is preventing it from germinating um, and that is preventing stand establishment. And we didn't see that. Yes? So you no, because that would be the case. Um, it's what you see in rain-fed conditions. No? If you have rain after planting, you get uh, crust formation, um, actually especially with conventional um, tillage, um, and then you do see something that looks very similar as this, but in this case it's irrigated uh, and there wasn't any rain after planting. So it's very strange, um, and we needed to find a way to, um, to see what was going on. Uh, we did several experiments with seed treatments, and because it looks like something biological, um, the, the logical idea is that there's some disease, even though we couldn't find the disease when we dug up the seed and uh, Monica Mesalama analyzed them in the lab, and she said, like, well, they're fine, they're even germinating still in the lab. Um, so we did this, uh, putting plastic on the soil for uh, solarization to, um, it's not complete sterilization, but it reduces um, what life there is in your soil. So normally when you have a biological problem and you do this, uh, then normally uh, you would expect the problem to be solved. So we did, um, we used different seed treatments here. You can see there's the check without any seed treatment. Um, there's tiamatoxam, which is a, an insecticide. There's fungicide, uh, a cocktail of two, uh, diphenoconazole and mefenoxam. And then uh, there is everything together in treatment four. This is with wet planting. As we saw in the first picture, it, at wet planting, um, everything is fine to begin with. So everything is still fine if you uh, treat it with seed or if you solarize uh, your soil. Then this is what we see with dry planting. And I must say in 2013, after we did the solarization, we did have a very extreme uh, condition in the dry planting part in that so we planted, we irrigated, so then your soil is very wet during germination. Um, and then after one week it rained, so it stayed wet for even uh, longer than normal in our dry planting. So the effect that we saw was more extreme than in other years. So you can see here in the first two treatments, while well, still almost no plants at all. I mean, it, it doesn't look this bad in the checking every year, uh, but it did that year. Then we see when we use fungicide, um, we see that the problem is solved. And we also see in solarization here, you see that it's still a bit reduced compared to the other treatments, but you do see considerably more plants here than there. So that confirms that there's a biological issue that we've solved with solarization or that we can solve with these fungicides. And then to narrow it down a bit further, we did uh, in the next year um, 
So the fungicide is usually sold as this or a cocktail with even more, but we got the separate active ingredients to see what uh, was actually controlling the problem, um, which you can see that methanoxam alone here, which controls uh, omicetes, uh, does solve the problem. So that points to something like pitium, for example, is an example of omicetes. Um, the only issue that we have is that, so we've dug up seeds again, we've done soil experiments and we can't find the pitium. Uh, so we're still not entirely sure what is causing it. Currently there's a PhD student in, in Simbestav who's trying to look at the soil and really identifying the organisms and the population shifts that must be happening here uh, that we uh, haven't been able to identify yet. But, I mean, in the short term, uh, there's an easy recommendation for farmers that want to plant dry in conservation agriculture. They should make sure that their seed treatment has this active ingredient uh, that is available in Mexico. So that was just an example of a simple problem with a simple solution uh, that we haven't fully understood yet, uh, but that we have identified. Then, example of a um, research for impact in the longer term is looking at genotype by system interaction. Um, the idea there is that um, with conservation agriculture, we have seen that our soil quality changes compared to conventional practices. So the idea is if you change your soil environment, do you also need to adapt your genotypes? Or if you select uh, under conservation agriculture, do we select for different things than if we uh, select under conventional tillage? So we've done some research um, in collaboration with the cement breeders. There's two experiments uh, that I'm going to show right now. The first one is taking uh, the materials uh, of bread wheat and durum wheat that the breeders have bred under conventional systems and putting those under CA and under uh, conventional systems to see if there's any interaction between genotype and the system uh, that they're in. The other thing we did together uh, with uh, Karim Amar, uh, so for durum wheat, seeing if you do parallel selection, so if you select from the same parents under conservation agriculture and under conventional tillage, do uh, the results of that selection differ? Are they more adapted to conservation agriculture or do they have certain benefits under drought, for example, um, from one selection system rather than the other? So looking at the first thing, so the, um, we looked at the materials that the breeders have uh, bred under conventional systems. Um, I'll show you the results of uh, 26 wheat varieties. Uh, and there's 13 durum ones and 13 bred ones for six seasons. And we put them in four environments. Um, so we have two different tillage practices, permanent beds and conventionally tilled beds and two irrigation uh, schemes. One is full irrigation, that's one pre-planting irrigation and four uh, during the season. And then reduced irrigation where we have only one irrigation pre-planting and one at heading. Okay, and these um, are some graphs. So we have, we use genotypes that are dating from the Green Revolution genotypes uh, all the way up to uh, more recent ones. So we planted those in six uh, seasons, only well, more seasons, but uh, these are the results of six seasons. Um, and you can see the average uh, progress here. Um, this is for bread wheat, and this is uh, for durum wheat. And Nora just summarized that in a paper that has been accepted, so soon you'll be able to uh, look at all the details. Um, here, you can just say breeding progress. Well, I forgot to say here. So you can see here, um, those lines we have blue for conventional and um, green for the permanent beds. And here uh, it's red for the conventional beds and uh, purple for the, the permanent beds. So you can see there's uh, progress in uh, all uh, environments over the years, uh, but there's little difference uh, between that progress. And there's, um, if you look at the analysis, there's also um, very little uh, genotype by tillage interaction um, overall. So then if you're looking at so the parallel selection and then um, planting those genotypes that were selected from the two parallel streams, planting them under conservation agriculture in uh, conventionally tilled beds and 
Additionally, in conventionally tilled beds with drought, because Karim thought that maybe uh, selecting under conservation agriculture could give you um, a selection for early vigor and a, um, with that an advantage um, in drought conditions. So that's why we had three different environments. Um, so we did that experiment for three years uh, with almost 500 uh, genotypes in three repetitions um, in the three environments. And um, I'll show you the detailed results in a minute. Um, the lines selected under conventional tillage perform statistically significant better in both systems. Um, but if we look at the absolute numbers, yield differences are marginal at best. So here you can see the, so we did the experiment in three years. Um, here you can see the test environment. So here we planted the, the uh, lines that came out of the conventional selection stream and the zero tillage selection stream in conventional tillage. And you can see the same. So this is drought and in zero tillage. Um, so you can see that the difference is significant in most uh, cases. But then if you compare the numbers, the actual differences are very, very small. Um, so in reality, it seems like it doesn't matter much. Um, and that means that you can select under conservation agriculture. Um, if you want to, you can select under uh, conventional uh, systems if you want to and end up with very uh, similar results. So um, you can interrupt me if you have any questions, if you want to go more into detail. But. Okay, um, so then uh, last example of, of the research topics, uh, looking at blue sky research, soil microbial community uh, research that we're doing in collaboration with Simba staff, um, which is a university uh, with a lab based in Mexico City. Um, at first, when the whole, uh, well, the possibility of looking at microbial uh, communities um, started, we looked at just simple characterizations of what is, uh, what are the organisms that we have in the different soils and is there an effect of uh, conservation agriculture or of tillage or, or residual um, practice. Um, now we're shifting more to functionality as in, for example, if you add residue to a soil, which are the organisms that um, are growing more or less and participate in, in processing that research, uh, that residue or that uh, fertilizer. So um, this is just an example of what we were doing uh, at the beginning, looking at those trees that I think everybody has seen. And uh, sometimes we saw that there was higher diversity and richness with conservation agriculture. And sometimes uh, in other experiments, uh, there wasn't. So now we're looking a little bit more at uh, functionality. This is an example of an experiment where we added residue um, to soil. Um, and you can see here there's flat planting and there's bed planting. And then within that, it's very tiny letters, but um, so every group that you can see here is um, at the beginning and then after incubation um, for as in the legend, one day, three days, seven days, and 14 days. Uh, so adding residue and then seeing how the population evolves. And then um, within here, there's different uh, management practices. So we have conventionally tilled beds and uh, permanent beds and the same on the flat. Um, so, I mean, you can check the details uh, if you want um, in the paper. Um, but we did see that there are differences in microbial community um, and that it seems that when you have a conservation agriculture soil, since your residue is staying uh, mostly on the soil surface, that we have um, certain groups um, that are oligotrophs that are more abundant in conservation agriculture and that then when you add residue uh, to that uh, soil, they shift a bit more towards what you have in conventional agriculture where the residue is mixed uh, through tillage um, and that those populations uh, get a bit closer together, to say it uh, very briefly. Um, this is another example of the same, the same experiment where we do see that our microbial communities, what we expected as well, are different. They're not, they're, 
aren't as different as if you take two different soils, I mean from two different locations, you'll see that the microbial community is a lot more different than the effect that we have with management on your soil microbial community, but still um, we see, so you can basically see that it's not a very strong separation, it depends a bit on the experiment, but that you do see that green and red and blue are uh, separated uh, to some extent, which tells us that we do have different uh, communities there. So that was very briefly uh, an idea of the research that we do uh, on station. Then, of course, um, we try to share uh, the results and experiment and experience that we gain uh, from that research, not only through um, journal publications, but also more applied materials like extension articles, uh, training materials um, that we've uh, made throughout the years uh, of some uh, more the practical guides that we have. We've made some videos as well uh, that you can look at uh, online. Getting to impact in farmers' fields, which is, of course, uh, everybody's, uh, I think, ultimate goal here, um, happens through the connection of those results that we have to our research and extension hubs, which um, we'll talk a little bit more about uh, in a minute. And uh, we also do a lot of training uh, through students, um, also through the international training course uh, that we normally run uh, every year. This year we skipped uh, a year, um, but usually um, we do a five-week course in May and June every year that we do here, uh, May and June. So that means that we do it during planting, uh, which makes it possible to make it as practical as possible. And the objective of that course is to train researchers to develop strong agronomy programs in the national systems um, that also uh, use the hub concept that we have for technology development and extension and teamwork and interdisciplinary work. So we've trained 137 researchers in that way over the years since uh, Ken Sayre started this in 96. And so that was what we do on the station now. I want to talk a little bit about the research uh, that we do in the network with collaborators. So in the research platforms that we have, you can see them on the map here. It goes all the way up to Mexicali and all the way down uh, to the south. We have more than 50 locations in Mexico where uh, we have conservation agriculture based experiments uh, that look at how uh, we can make that conservation agriculture based uh, practices work in different production systems. Mexico is a very interesting country to be in, uh, to be able to do this kind of research because it's uh, very, very diverse in terms of soil, climate, production systems, uh, socioeconomic conditions of the farmers, etc. So we have those platforms uh, that are run by researchers of the national system that are really focused on, okay, so what are the, the problems that we have in a certain production system in a certain area and what are the technologies that we can um, try out to address those issues. So the first years, we started this in 2011. Um, so in the first years, uh, we mainly focused on capacity building with researchers to get a core set of data that is uh, mainly yield data uh, and some uh, physiological data throughout the season and making sure that those experiments are run as well as possible uh, because of course that's where everything starts to get uh, good data. So now we're ready uh, to uh, broaden our research topics a little bit. We still have some turnover uh, within our network so that means that each year we do an evaluation of uh, the platforms and uh, usually some um, are closed off and others uh, can start. Also depending, of course, on new projects that we have, sometimes at the state level, for example, in Mexico. So um, looking at a couple of results, um, this is from an experiment that was started in 2015 in San Martin Hidalgo in Jalisco, uh, which is a high rainfall area and very high input maize production. Um, and here, the second year of the experiment, we see these are different Tillage treatments, we have zero tillage, uh, permanent narrow beds, permanent broad beds, and uh, conventional tillage. And we didn't see uh, any significant differences, which is a bit like what we see in Obregón, for example, that um, 
if we don't have um, clear uh, water uh, limiting factor, then uh, we don't always see differences in yield. Exception to that is an experiment that INIFAP started in 95 that is now also part of the, the platform network in Soledad de Graciano Sanchez, which is in San Luis Potosí. Um, here we have two crops a year, maize in the summer, and then in the winter he divides the plots in uh, oats, and uh, half of the plot is, in, is with oats, and the other half with uh, triticale. He used to only use oats, but then uh, with masagro and uh, seeing triticale, um, there's some frost in the winter in uh, San Luis Potosí, so he wanted to use that as an option uh, because triticale is more frost resistant than oats. Um, and here we do see very clear um, differences in soil quality. This is just a picture, um, but I think it's a, it's a very clear picture, and we do see the same in, in the measurements uh, that we've done there. Um, we have better soil structure, better infiltration in uh, conservation agriculture there, and that results in almost 50% yield difference between the treatments with tillage. He has like different options, like a lot of tillage and a little bit less tillage and a little bit less. Um, and then here we can see uh, with permanent beds with different levels of residue. So this is actually the only clear documented example that I've seen of um, a system where they've been removing all of the residue for that long, uh, where there's no effect um, on yield. So here, um, we have permanent beds without residue retention um, that do ha have the same yield as when we keep all of the residue in the field. Um, he does have two crops a year. One is a small grain crop, so again, uh, you're leaving, uh, if you have uh, oats in, or triticale in this case, you leave always a bit of stubble, of course, uh, because you can take it all off and you leave that roots. It has high biomass production, so that could be why even taking away all the above ground uh, residue that he doesn't see a negative effect on yield there or on soil quality for that matter. So that's good transition to looking at residues. Uh, crop residue retention is an interesting component of conservation agriculture in terms of research questions. There dif there's different issues depending on the production system with um, residue retention. For example, here, in Chiapas, um, in Ocosingo, we see that farmers are used to burning residue, um, which is expensive, um, results in, in, in soil degradation. Uh, so there we're looking at, can we just keep the residue that they're not using for anything else? Can we keep that in the field uh, instead of burning it? Then um, in San Juan del Rio, Rio in Querétaro, um, they say that leaving a lot of maize residue in the field increases the incidence or the damage of uh, frost in barley. Um, so there, the first thing is like quantifying that. Is that actually, um, is that a perception or is it an actual effect that we see? And if so, uh, how much residue do we need to maintain uh, for soil quality and how much should we take off to reduce um, that uh, damage of the frost? And then here, uh, in Texcoco and in, in many other areas, farmers need residue as forage for livestock. So there, um, how much, again, do we need to leave in the field? Can we take part of the residue to use for fodder or what other forage options uh, can we offer to farmers to um, keep cover in the field and also feed those animals? Then looking at rotation, this is an example from um, Moncajac in Puebla. Um, this is very low rainfall, low input maize, monoculture. Uh, they have very low yields to the extent that you'd say uh, since it's a low rainfall area, probably there's other crops that are more suited um, to the conditions there, but farmers want to grow maize um, because they want to eat maize, um, of course. So uh, that's why they, they're not very willing to shift from maize uh, to something else. But here we can see, so there's uh, four treatments here um, over the years. Uh, we can see the conventional uh, tillage treatment. Then we have permanent beds where we keep residue, but still do monoculture of maize. Um, and here there's two lines because we have one treatment with inorganic 
uh, fertilizer, and there's one with uh, compost, and it uh, doesn't really much, make much difference here which one you use in terms of yield. And then here we have permanent beds, keeping residue, and the maize bean rotation. Basically, you see that when you do that, you double your yields. So that means that if farmers harvest twice as, can harvest twice as much uh, maize in one year or divide their field in two and harvest uh, the same amount of maize on half of the field than they would otherwise do on the whole field, they can add an additional uh, bean crop in the other part of the field and um, have the same maize overall. And in addition to that, have some uh, beans as well to diversify their diet. And bean prices are very, very high at the moment as well. So, um, so that's a good thing. And we see the same in very high input conditions. This is Navajoa, Sonora. Uh, which is uh, close to Ciudad Obregón in the north. Um, and here uh, we have a platform. These are the results uh, from uh, 2015 harvest, where we have wheat, maize, and safflower grown in monoculture and in rotation. And in each of the graphs, the last bar is the uh, bar uh, that is monoculture. And you can see that in each of the cases, it's the one uh, with the lowest yield. So those research platforms are part of the innovation hubs, um, explaining Masagro and explaining innovation hubs is a, is a whole uh, different presentation, but just uh, very briefly. Um, so what we do, as, I, as we discussed right now in the research platforms, we're testing different options for a certain production system that is connected to modules in farmers' fields where farmers uh, do their farmer, normal farmer practice on half of the field and use some uh, innovation on the other half uh, of the field to make the comparison uh, to connect those farmers not only to the research but to other uh, actors in the value chain. And then we have extension areas where farmers adopt the technology that either they've seen in a module or uh, a research platform and uh, don't make necessarily the comparison anymore um, like we do in the modules with farmer practice. So the research platforms are part of those innovation systems. Um, firstly, because of the research, of course, that they do, looking at those different options, comparing those, uh, and then giving recommendations. But they're also a physical place where people can come together. Often they're in an institution, for example, uh, where they also have uh, an auditorium where we, that we can use for trainings um, or where we can uh, put machinery that, uh, so that can function as a machinery point, um, etc. So then um, most of what I, of, or all of the things that I discussed up until now uh, were uh, was research done in Mexico. We're starting to work a little bit in Central America as well. Um, in Guatemala, we have a couple of uh, agronomic experiments uh, that aren't really research platforms like uh, the ones we just discussed, uh, but they did participate this year in the, the symposium that we did about uh, the research platforms here in Mexico. So I'm hoping that uh, they will incorporate a bit more of those other elements, not just research, uh, but using the platforms as a place a uh, starting por point for extension, et cetera, as well. And we also have a project uh, where we're working in Guatemala, Honduras, and El Salvador, um, looking at yield gap analysis um, in six experiments uh, this year in different uh, production areas. Uh, we were working with uh, CAI there in a, a project. So that was our field research. Uh, now I'll say a little bit about uh, post-harvest in the last couple of minutes. Um, so as I said, we've been working on post-harvest in the team since uh, last year. In Masagro, we've been working on post-harvest uh, for a bit longer than that, since 2013. Um, there was some work on post-harvest, uh, but we felt it needed a bit more structuring 
and a bit more uh, research as well to get uh, to solid recommendations. So that way, that's why we started incorporating that in our team. So post-harvest is a very general term. Um, it covers everything from harvest that happens after. Um, so uh, in CIMIT, we've been focusing mainly on the storage component and storage for uh, small-scale farmers. Uh, a large farmer harvests a lot, so they uh, sell immediately after harvest, and then um, that grain is stored in very large facilities that don't really, um, that we're not very uh, connected to or have a lot of expertise in. So it's important to uh, keep in mind that what we're working on is post-harvest for small farmers uh, that in Mexico are mainly uh, maize farmers. So currently, estimates of post-harvest losses in Mexico range from 10 to 40 percent. It depends, of course, on the production system. Um, and also, the range is very broad because there's no uh, very good data available on how much uh, is actually lost. Grain drying and cleaning practices are not adequate. Most farmers just let the grain dry in the field and then harvest it uh, when, they, when they feel it's ready uh, and dry enough. There's a lack of mechanization of threshing. Uh, so most farmers in Mexico, the small maize farmers, so they harvest cobs um, and then they'll thresh uh, throughout the year. Every day, uh, mostly the women will thresh 10 kilograms or a bucket or whatever uh, they need to feed uh, the family and livestock. So if you look at the, these are the farmer characteristics of the farmers that are uh, involved in the post-harvest work that we do, so not the general uh, population of farmers in Mexico. Um, so we have an average age of over 40, family size of over four, average yields um, less than three tons per hectare. This, the three tons is actually still uh, quite high. Uh, that's because it's for the whole of Mexico, so there's more productive areas. Uh, there's also areas where your average yield will be below uh, one ton per hectare, of course. Um, averaged over all the farmers that we interviewed, these are the results of uh, 1,300 uh, interviews. Um, they store one and a half tons of maize for about seven months. Um, the majority of farmers uses insecticide during storage, and um, most of the grain is stored for home consumption. Some is sold on local markets. There is low adoption of hermetic technologies. Most of the interviews were done in 2013, but uh, still uh, today uh, adoption is low. So to give you some background, hermetic technologies are um, basically any recipients that are suitable to, uh, for storage of, some of uh, food um, that you can close hermetically. The way they work is that uh, through the respiration of the grain and through the respiration of the insects that might be present in the grain, um, the oxygen inside the recipient is depleted. And so any larvae or insects that are uh, present in the grain um, will die as the oxygen uh, is depleted. So those hermetic technologies, um, low adoption, low availability, lack of interest uh, with farmers in purchasing uh, these technologies because very often government programs or NGOs um, that are looking to give uh, things away um, are giving them away. Uh, so that impedes, of course, the market development at the local uh, scale. Often the technologies that are given away for free are low quality, so that means that they're called silos metallicos, metal silos, but the hermetic part uh, isn't there, so they're not hermetic, they're just silos, uh, which means, of course, that the mechanism that I just described for them to work does not work, uh, which gives them also a, a reputation of not working um, that they don't deserve, of course. Uh, there's a lack of technical assistance, so often, um, farmers get a uh, silo, but they're not told uh, what the moisture content of the grain needs to be uh, when they store it. Uh, and if you store moist grain in a hermetic container, you get fermentation. That's, of course, uh, bad as well. Um, they're not told how to check that their uh, silo is hermetic, how to uh, give maintenance, etc. And then if you look at the commercialization part, lack of formal organization and market transparency, 
and limited access uh, of the to the national market for small farmers. So even if um, I'm a small farmer and I double my yields, like we saw with some of the technologies uh, from our field research, then after harvest, what do I do uh, with that grain if I don't have uh, anywhere to sell it at a fair price uh, or any way to store that grain uh, for later use um, so that it doesn't get bad. So um, what would we like to see? Um, Post-harvest management really starts before harvest because the insects that infest the grain are usually present um, from the field. So the larvae are in the grain uh, at the moment of storage. Um, so you should manage your crop uh, already in the field to prevent uh, infestation. We would like to see a local market of technologies, of those hermetic type technologies, or uh, also things to dry, thresh, clean, and then store uh, the grain and seed. Um, farmers that produce enough maize to satisfy their household consumption and uh, have a surplus so that they can sell and sell at a fair and transparent price. And uh, for that, we need organization and commercial integration um, with storage infrastructure and linkages to formal markets. Um, I'm just saying this is sort of a wish list. No, this is what we would like to see. I will get to how we get there in a minute. So if you look more in detail at post-harvest, so farmers should harvest their grain at the right time and then dry it with affordable technologies, then thresh it efficiently, accessibly, reducing the workload that I discussed. Imagine if you have to uh, shell a bucket of grain every day. Um, and then farmers store the grain in affordable technologies that maintain the grain quality and quantity and do not have adverse health effects. If you remember at the beginning, we saw that um, more than half of the farmers in Mexico use insecticide. They don't use usually protective equipment while they do that. Often they uh, store the treated grain in their houses. So that means that they're living in presence of that insecticide um, that they are using. Okay, so what is CIMIT doing in terms of post-harvest? Um, development of technologies and recommendations. As I said, we've mostly worked on storage and we're starting now a little bit to get into the drying, threshing and cleaning part because uh, we've noticed also that the storage part doesn't work if you don't offer it together with the other uh, components. We work on capacity development and extension pretty much through the same system that I just mentioned with platforms, with modules, with extension areas. We also have those uh, for post-harvest uh, technologies. And we give uh, training uh, as well uh, to blacksmiths about how to construct uh, hermetic uh, metal silos. And then we're starting some work now on development of a technology market, um, which is essential, of course, for scaling, that those technologies are uh, available locally. Um, which is a, an issue right now, as I, as I mentioned. So then just very quickly to close off um, some uh, idea of how those technologies work. Uh, these are some results from uh, platforms uh, here in uh, Valle Saltos um, in the Highlands. We had four last year. In here, the one that we had on station had very little damage overall, so it's not in the graph. And here we have uh, Calpan in Puebla, Ixtacuixla in Tlaxcala, Sacualtipan Hidalgo. Um, the treatments that we use in those platforms depend um, on what the collaborators uh, say they're interested in based on the local uh, practices. So the local check is different depending uh, on the area and also a little bit um, uh, different are the technologies that we try out. But in each one we have metal silos you can see here this uh, silo metallico hermetico, the abbreviation, um, and uh, the local practice is marked in uh, with an asterisk here. So you can see that basically, <coughs> sorry, your um, insect damage is um, reduced a lot if you use the right hermetic uh, technology, and it's high when you just use a polypropylene bag, which is a farmer practice or uh, a bucket. Insecticide, as you can see here, does work, um, but because of the, the health effects um, 
that I mentioned earlier, uh, we try to avoid it. But we do include it, of course, as a treatment. Then this is uh, fungal damage. The scale is different here, so it went up to 80% here, and here it's only at 10%, uh, so it's uh, considerably lower than the insect damage that we see. But we do see that in some of the platforms here, we um, have lower fungal damage um, with the, the bag than uh, we see in hermetic technologies. So that is something that we need to get into more, um, as well with the, the drying that I mentioned earlier that is very important um, for storage. So that was basically uh, all I wanted to share. And if you have any questions, I'd be happy to take them. Okay, thank you for your, for your presentation. I have two questions. Um, CIMIT is promoting conservation agriculture basically all over the world, not only here. And um, you showed a graph where you had 20 years of data consistently showing that conservation agriculture is basically better than the traditional or the conventional way. <clears throat> My question is to what extent is the availability of this kind of data a limiting factor to, let's say, the uptake of the technology? And second question, what mechanisms exist within CIMIT to, to learn from and to exchange knowledge with the similar kind of experiments that are going on in Africa and in Asia? Okay. Um, so to your first question, I do think it's sometimes a limiting factor. Um, that's what the platforms try to address um, in an important way. Um, I don't think... Well, the platforms address the, the lack of availability of data, but also that farmers can see it a lot closer to home than, um, than in a graph um, <coughs> from an experiment that was done at CIMIT. So I think they help in that way. Um, it's probably not the most limiting factor for uh, adoption of conservation agriculture. I mean, there's machinery, there's um, trade-offs for residue. I mean, there's other issues uh, that are also important limiting factors. Um, for the adoption of conservation agriculture. Um, then to your second question, um, mechanisms within CIMIT. Um, we do have like program meetings um, every year or every two years, um, but it's, I think, the most um, effective, but not really a formal mechanism is, is the contact that we have with colleagues, of course, um, of other regions that isn't as, as as developed as we would like it to be, uh, I don't think. Uh, I think there's certain, certainly room for improvement there, but um, that's mostly how we do it. Okay, thanks, uh, thanks, Nele. <coughs> You're okay? No. You need some water? Mm -hmm. No, thanks for your uh, presentation and, and for the long-term trials and on-station work. But one thing that strikes me as, I mean, it's purely yield that you have reported, yeah? I mean, every time, every single slide was yield, yield, yield. And so there's no economic analysis whatsoever. Although you did mention somewhere as one of the third principles, diversification had a bit of economics in there, but otherwise, but really I think, yeah, we should make some economic analysis of this. Of, of course, yield is a main driver, but because of the cost savings, but also the residues that you mentioned, etc. Mm -hmm. really looking at this, especially if you start looking at crop diversification, does it really make sense? So, I mean, that would be a, yeah, we, we a have big area. Actually. And then the other one, I mean, just listening to you, yeah, I mean, the on-station work didn't seem at all influenced by the on-farm work. And it looks really <coughs> like the on-station work is perpetual long-term trials and, and I didn't see or hear any linkage of how your on-farm work is kind of what the platforms is in any way influencing or setting some research questions on station. And it, it sounded very much a linear kind of, yeah, we, we, we know what is the solution and we just push the solution. There's training, capacity building, but I didn't hear much in terms of any iterations or any learning that, that possibly could be a strength of, uh, of Mazagro and the type of work that I thought you were presenting. Thank you. Um, okay, so to the first uh, comment, 
I only had an hour no, to, to present, uh, yeah, to yeah. give a general idea of what we do, so I didn't include um, the part of economic analysis. We do do those. Um, and I mean, I can send you the report if you'd like. Um, of, we do those mainly in the platforms. Um, we've done them a little bit uh, based on our long-term trials. I think they're more relevant um, to what we do in the platforms than uh, to the long-term trials because there's different research questions that we have also in the long-term trials in the sense that uh, what we're looking at here, for example, in D5 is we're very interested in so tillage practice, residue management, crop rotation, and the effect that that has. But our yields are consistently higher than uh, the yields that we have of farmers here in the surrounding areas because those are not really our target uh, audience, I would say. So it's not a, a, a platform in that way. Whereas what we do in the network with collaborators and uh, the platforms there is really focused on a production system of a certain area. Why do we have higher yields here um, in our conventional <coughs> Sorry, it's just my throat hurts. Um, and our conventional practice is because our fertilizer management is different. Our uh, varieties that we use are different. So we have those other factors that we want to keep constant in that experiment that make that we have higher yields. Um, even if you look at our conventional treatment that has maybe yields of five tons of maize per hectare that our yields that the farmers uh, surrounding us uh, aren't getting. So. That was in terms of the economic. Um, then in terms of how the research and what we see with farmers uh, informs what we do, um, I guess I didn't uh, explain it properly. I mean, I do think that um, what I see in CIMIT is that we are probably the program that is most rooted in uh, what farmers need and what farmers are doing um, in Mexico. And that's information that we get uh, through the work that we do in Masagro. What I was presenting uh, today was not uh, Masagro. Um, I, I know that causes confusion within CIMIT uh, very often because Masagro is our biggest project, um, but it is not funding um, a lot of what I, what I showed today. So, um, so yeah, maybe it's something that we can discuss one day a bit more into detail. Um, but I disagree with, with that. Any other questions? Yes. So how often you change genotypes? For example, yeah. we have <coughs> lines coming out, uh, quite often new lines, so it's not much use of the old varieties, you know, so. Mm -hmm. yep. so in our long-term trials, because I think that's the question for the long-term trials, long -term how often trials. do we change? Um, we're uh, trying to have the best available material in our long-term trials. Uh, so for maize, um, up until now, that has been mostly commercial uh, material. For wheat, that, that tends to be uh, the latest material that you or Ravi or uh, any the wheat breeders give us. So we have um, component technology trials where we look at um, materials, we have those for maize uh, here and in Toluca, and for wheat, we have it here and in Obregón, of course. Um, and there we look at the last uh, lines that we get from you, and then we uh, compare it to what we have in the long-term trials, and if there's a significant improvement, then uh, we change. Um, I try to be a bit conservative so that we don't have too many changes. I don't want to put a different material every year, so I try to uh, keep them for as long as I think makes sense, and then I change it when I, um, when I feel that would be a significant improvement. Or, of course, with wheat, if, if we lose resistance, then I change the next year. Um, thank you for the, com the presentation. It was quite enlightening. Um, from the socioeconomic part of documenting the process of the hub, we have been thinking in the, plat the experimental platforms at something that follow off the on-farm research that was done in the context of farming system research. So let's say in bring the, trying to respond to this kind of, in, in place of the con continuing the on-station research, trying to do something in the fields of the farmers, and the platforms like something that in some way or another follow that pathway. Per so perhaps 
Well, one of the things is that I, I would like to, to listen to your opinion about that. And the second point is that during that time of the farming system research and on farm research, there was a lot of literature evidence saying that you could not do research similar, like, the same like in on station, in, in, well, on, like on station research, that you have to change your methods, that you have to change your approach, that the way of doing research change when you do it on farm. So I would like also to listen to you if, if you have been also experimenting in that and if you can give us an example. Yeah, um, the idea of the experimental platforms onto the point that I understand and the way that Ken and Pat will talk about it was like trying to bring to, there was an issue that conservation agriculture was not adopted and that there was, there should be uh, a way to do the things in a different way. So when they were thinking in the experimental platforms, they were thinking of doing something different than what was happening in the, on, on station research, like in here, no? And these uh, experimental platforms, perhaps in the traditional farming system research that CIMIT was one of the, of the reference on that, they were talking on, on farm research, like doing research in the conditions of the farmers, making a whole diagnostic, and there's a whole tradition of farming system research about that. So when we as socioeconomic document that, we are finding that um, experimental platforms are kind of sitting in that position. So I would like to hear your opinion. Perhaps you were not aware, but uh, uh, I would like to hear first your opinion about that. And the second point is that during that time that farming system research was very strong, that was the 80s, 90s, 2000s, there was also... I, 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 I got the second part, I just yeah. didn't understand uh, the first part of your question. Okay, um, so, is research on station always the same as what you would do in a farmer's field? No, of course not. Um, and I don't think it needs to be either. Um, I mean, you take decisions when you manage an experiment that aren't the same decisions as a farmer would take because you're a researcher and you're not a farmer um, when you take those decisions. That doesn't mean that we can't learn from on-station experiments for what we can do on farm. Um, I mean, when you're managing an experiment, you have research questions that you want to answer. And when you're managing a farm, you're managing a farm and you would look at profitability um, first and foremost. Um, so, I do think they're different. Um, I do think that what we are aiming for with the platforms is to be more representative of the production system that we are doing that research in, uh, and more so than what we are looking at uh, sometimes with our long-term trials, which are uh, often different research questions on a different scale uh, than what we are looking at um, when we have a research platform that is very focused on a certain uh, area and certain production system. Um, so yes, of course, uh, the aim there is to make it uh, more representative of what farmers do, but still the decision that you take as a researcher in a research platform isn't necessarily the same decision as a farmer is going to take. Um, because we need to look there also at the long term, at what are the research questions that we are looking to answer for the farmers that we are working for. Uh, that doesn't mean that we manage our platform the same way uh, that a farmer would, even if that the person managing a platform, which we have in some cases, is a farmer, uh, then still he might make different decisions um, for the platform than he would for the rest of his farm. Excuse me, there is one uh, question for uh, one of our participants. Uh, Abel Saldivia is asking, why did you, didn't uh, you use biological control agents for soil-borne pathogens management? Okay, um, well first we wanted to see, um, look at the, the active ingredients uh, that were there um, that would solve the problem and now I mean if there's an alternative, if there's a biological agent that uh, can control on mucetis, I'd be very happy to, to try that as well. Okay, thank you. No more questions? 
Okay, so thank you so much, Dr. Nelly. Thank you.